West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver All right, joining me now is the Democratic representative Stacey Plaskett of the United States Virgin Islands. She's a member of the House Intelligence Committee and the ranking member for the new Select Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. She also served as a House manager for the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. And it is a pleasure again to have you here uh, in the studio. Great it's to always see you. good to see you. And welcome back from that amazing trip that you made to Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk about everything that's going on right now. There's a lot of interest in Michael Cohen's going to be speaking to a grand jury. He's been there 20 times. I mean, you know this. You're a, you're, you're a lawyer. Um, something feels like it's going to happen there, but it's not the thing that most people are waiting for, right? The, sure. the, the Stormy Daniels payments, interesting though they are, that was in the quaint old days of maybe Donald Trump doesn't follow the rule of the law all as, sure. as carefully as the rest of us. Sure, that was the clutching your pearls. That was the clutching your pearls. Now, now now democracy is exactly. at stake. Exactly. And you heard my conversation, or a little of my conversation with Benny Thompson. I'm, uh, it, it, we're waiting for something to happen. Sure. Where are you in this process of waiting for things to happen? I think we're all expecting in the next before the fall, much of these indictments, if they are going to come through, to come through. Right. We've got Georgia where that is election interference. There's also the special prosecutor, which I think many of us have forgotten about. And I think that that's a very solid case in terms of the obstruction of justice, uh, interfering with government, not turning those documents over. Uh, the Espionage Act was exactly the act that the warrant to get the documents right. back cited. And then, of course, there is the January 6th, where Benny Thompson and my other colleagues did a masterful job of continuing pointing the crime back to Donald Trump from the words of his own staffers. Right. And I assume that the uh, special prosecutor is looking at that as well. So let's go, let's start with that, January 6th, because you were the first draft of that. As, mm -hmm. as an impeachment manager, you were laying out the first information. And then they spent a lot of time getting even more information. There are a lot of people watching this this morning who are asking, what's enough? Most of us wouldn't think we'd make it out of the building without being either fired or arrested or both if we engaged in any of this stuff. And lots of people have been arrested and charged with respect to January 6th. But what is enough to get the organizers of this thing to face justice? Well, I think that the special prosecutor has to be very careful because we are then going to be indicting a former president. Uh, that has not been done before. We've seen vice presidents indicted and charges brought before them, but we have not seen a president uh, face these kind of charges, basically attempting to overthrow the government of the United States. And so my assumption is, is that uh, the special prosecutor is going to have to make a very strong recommendation for Merrick Garland, who is not appointed by Trump. Right to be the individual to say, yes, we're pulling the trigger, we're going to do this. And we also have to remember that uh, while this should not be political, of course it is. Sure. 
And we have an election coming up in 2024, which to me signals that you've got to get this out the gate before it appears to many Americans, those independents, those Democrats, that you are doing it for political purposes. We know that we've lost the extreme right, mm -hmm. uh, that any uh, taint, anything that we've said that has evidence, that has facts about Donald Trump, they're not going to hear. Let's talk about Georgia. We all heard that perfect phone call, one right. of many perfect phone calls the former president made. That is being uh, pursued by Fannie Willis in mm -hmm. Georgia. Mm -hmm. It's also part of Jack Smith, the special prosecutor's um, remit. Where does that go? Because that's another one where every American heard what we think of as the evidence and the proof. I understand that a lot of people have to be interviewed under under oath. But tell me about the importance of that case and whether that's easier or harder to deal with. Well, uh, as a former prosecutor, I can see arguments that the defense will make that the phone call was really a suggestion of him finding votes that were already out there, not for him to fabricate votes. And so we've got to get, uh, you know, corroborating evidence, not just the phone call itself, but evidence that corroborates the intent of the president for him to fabricate that. That includes the slate of electors that they were tr attempting to bring in, as well as the actions of Rudy Giuliani and the cast of characters in his in his show. You and I talked, uh, I think it might have been the last time, about this select com subcommittee that you're on, mm -hmm. on the weaponization of the federal government. Mm -hmm. And I think we both agreed that we don't want to see the weaponization of the federal government, but we're, we were not sure that this committee's intentions uh, are pure as a driven snow. Where are you now that there's been a little bit of time? What is this committee doing and what are you hopeful about and what are you worried about? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm exhausted, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm I am very uh, now of the mind frame that this is really a political stunt on the part of Jim Jordan and others. I see the pressure that he is getting uh, from those on the right, from others in the Republican Party who want this to be Benghazi 2.0 that want this to be something that can be used against uh, the entire Biden administration. Uh, for example, we're discussing Twitter in the last one. I thought we had already gone through a hearing with Twitter and the Oversight Committee, but the Weaponization Committee looked at it. And the things that they were, you know, first of all, you have a journalist who put out a report that say that the emails that they have viewed are in fact the smoking gun that the federal government is looking at this. Well, let's just take that in context. First of all, they admitted to us that there were hundreds of thousands of emails that they saw, and they focused only on 300. Uh, and so we believe that that's out of context. Second of all, they were talking about the FBI having paid um, Twitter. FBI pays all social media uh platforms because they know at different points they're going to have to get data collection for them. Right. And that's their upfront paying a fee that they know they're going to have to need when they need to get information fast from neo-Nazis, white supremacists. Right, so they're not having that negotiation so on, they're a, not gonna have on a that given day. Exactly. Right. And, and that's what Jim Jordan is trying to make something out of. Additionally, they want to talk about uh, the Federal Trade Commission that is looking at Twitter. The Federal Trade Commission entered into consent degree with Twitter long before Elon Elon Musk right. came on board. And so the question is, why is Jim Jordan, why are these reporters so interested in doing the bidding of Elon Musk? Right. Uh, and so that becomes problematic because Twitter only represents 7% of individuals who are online. Uh, and while the American people have so many much more important issues, they want us to look at the shiny object that they've put in in front of us yes. rather than... Because one of the issues is last weekend at CPAC, the former president of the United States, who's running to be the president of the United States, right? told everybody, I am your justice, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. That worried that's, me. What does that mean? Anybody I don't scary. like, if I get reelected, I'm going to take care of using the levers of government. The implication to me seemed quite clear. Exactly. While at the same time, members of the House of Representatives, Republican members, are attempting to go and visit insurrectionists uh, in jail. Uh, they want special treatment for people that have tried to overthrow our government. 
government. This is madness. Yeah. Uh, our president has put out a budget. Uh, the Republicans, particularly the Freedom Caucus, give us a ransom note uh, rather than putting out their own budget. About the, about the death ceiling. What, what we're going to do, yeah. uh, what, this is how we're going to hold the American people hostage. Uh, and this is what we need from you before we release you from debt and before we sit down and negotiate on the budget. What they did say in the budget is that they're going to roll back over $400 billion of veterans' health care, all of the discretionary funding, the things that we have all been working on to bring Americans some relief yeah. so that we can get ahead. That's what the chaos that is happening that uh, Speaker McCarthy has put us in by giving up the gavel yeah. to the madness within his We life. all wondered in the, that, that, that crazy week of his election what he was offering and what he was giving well, up. Well, we saw we're with uh, now, yeah. Tucker Carlson yeah. and others. Uh, this is exactly what he yeah. gave up. It is Monday, the 13th of March of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. Yes, we made it through the weekend. Uh, I noticed, I'm sure that you did too if you follow me on social media, but it seems like the Ronnie Jackson happy hour starts pretty early in the morning and then goes all day. All day! And I don't know if it ever stops. Uh, certainly not during this weekend. But anyway, uh, I also want to know how a drunken Nazi like Ronnie Jackson can get on all of these TV shows, these cable news shows, asking them questions. I thought you were not supposed to be drunk on broadcast TV. I thought there was a rule. I could be mistaken. Maybe they changed it. But I'd be a little concerned that uh, you know, people might be uh, risking their license. And yes, there are licensings for cable, just so you know. But anyway, uh, I maybe maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe you can go on and uh, just be a blithering, drunken Nazi idiot. <laughs> Apparently, there it's happening already. Whether. Uh, whether he should, that's another question, isn't it? Okay. Well, uh, the GOP, at least on my Twitter feed, seem to dominate. I can't seem to get any of the people that I follow to I don't show up on my timeline on a regular basis. And there's other people that are experiencing the same thing. I Rarely do I just happen upon uh, one of my follows, one of my friends there. I have to, like, find them. <laughs> What's up with that? Before, it was just, it was great. Uh, you know, my my timeline and feed was filled with uh, all the news and tidbits and questions and answers and jokes and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and now it's a constant barrage of right-wing Nazi BS. It just is endless boy and there are nobody none of them are anybody that i follow but they dominate i it, it, it's, it's almost it's almost like it's on purpose isn't it because it is well there's that going unfortunately we have the others um the other uh, platforms, uh, Mastodon and Spoutable, is where I spend a lot of my time also. But they still got to get up to speed. You know, look, for all of its problems and stuff, uh, Twitter Twitter afforded a kind of communication that uh, we had not really had in our history as a species. And uh, maybe, maybe. We know that's why it's being destroyed, because it worked too good for us. It did. All right. So, uh, yeah, we have news on the SFB uh, bank collapse, so we won't go into that too much. Uh, Ron DeSantis, uh, Judd Legum. Is that how I is that how one pronounces his name? Let me get back up here. It's uh, he took. Yeah. Jug, Judd Legum. I was correct. I I read the guy all the time. 
I guess I've never said his name out loud before. Regardless, uh, he has the popular information blog, and he did a very what's called a meticulous uh, debunking of DeSantis's uh, claims that that there's a book ban going on in Florida, that that's a hoax. <laughs> Can you believe this guy, DeSantis? Anybody saying there's book bans going on in this state, it's a hoax. While at the same time, books are being banned. So uh, either go to the Raw Story, uh, go to Raw Story, the, you know, the template is there or the place, the placemat. Yeah, I guess you would call it a placemat is there. And I think you can get to his popular information blog from there or just go to his popular information blog and read it. It's uh, it is. It's meticulous. So, uh, yeah, not that, you know, facts and evidence means anything to them. (laughs) <laughs> it's all woke. It's all woke. Everything's woke. What a bunch of racist bigots. <laughs> My God. And they revel in it, too. Ugh. Yeah, I was listening to Marjorie Taylor Greene going off on Plaskett, uh, who was the representative on uh, uh, our Ollie's. Ali's uh, show at the top there um, saying it was in another committee hearing and just coming off total white Karen racist BS demanding that Plaskett uh, remove her words from uh, the congressional record uh, because she referred to a witness's statements and books, et cetera, et cetera, as being racist, white racist, that it was not showing proper respect. You're not showing proper respect for that witness. Boy, I don't know. I just, they got in. Before she'd even been sworn in, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she was asking for a pardon. Why? Because she's part of the insurgency and remains so. That's It was an insurrection when people came through the doors. When electeds like McCarthy, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Burbert, Massey, et cetera, uh, Cruz, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Once those electeds become involved, it is then an insurgency. And it goes on as we speak. It's very important to uh, bone up on Rachel Maddow's ultra because we went through this before. Funny how we didn't really learn too much about it in school. We talked about it in my house. Not a lot, but, you know, we talked about it. I mean, hell, we talked about the black cowboy. And you you, you would ask a teacher back in the day about the black cowboy, and you you, you almost sometimes felt you were going to get hit. The only cowboys that mattered are John Wayne. No black cowboys, what are you talking about? So, yeah, we talked about the attempted Nazi takeover of the United States of America during World War II and before. We talked about uh, Lindbergh being a a Nazi. There's no getting around it. Jesus. Henry Ford. Total racist Nazi. Well, that was before Nazis, but he was a total racist. Let's be clear. I mean, heck, even Woodrow Wilson. So I was fortunate. We talked about that around our house. Black cowboy at school? Like I said, sometimes you felt like you were going to get hit for bringing it up. Because it was, oh, you're making that up. And this is from my teachers. Well, you know, my dad's a university professor in history. And he had a lot of books. And I read them. I'd be, uh, I'd be breaking the law now. My dad would have been uh, contributing to the delinquency of a minor because he, you know, because I read uh, uh, Big Rock Candy Mountain. There's sex in there. All right. 
Okay, well, I guess I can't read Treasure Island now either. Jeez. Man Friday. Uh Uh-huh. It's all about sex. Got to keep the kids from the sex. Okay, yeah, sure. At the same time, you're going to allow child weddings, child brides to be married off. And and kids to work in uh, the factories, child labor, signing up, signing bills, laughing about it. I don't know if you saw the picture of uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, now the governor, uh, signing a child labor law into law. And she and a bunch of people are just yucking it up. And her three kids look so dour because they realize it could be them. Child labor. Yeah, they're all about the child. And yet, I don't know, it seems like a preponderance of uh, child sexual abuse comes from their churches. But I don't, I never like to get into those types of arguments because you can look at predatory pedophilia and it, it kind of runs the gamut of, of the political spectrum. But it does seem, shall I say odd, that there's a preponderance of these of these stories, at least the you know, preponderance of the stories. Maybe we're just hearing about it more and uh maybe maybe the the media is slanted against the right wing and they just bring up when the right wingers do it. But there's a lot of churches, uh, you know, involved in all sorts of weird, lascivious things that ha- deal with pedophilia. Not just pedophilia, just all sorts of freaky stuff. And I don't see any drag queen uh, story hours. Uh, kids coming out of there are being abused, except for people like DeSantis saying that they're being abused with knowledge and equity. You know, they talk about equality and equity like that's a bad thing. It's woke. Okay. Those who are not woke tend to, you know, walk off the edge of the cliff. Wake up. If you're sleepwalking, you could walk right off the edge of the cliff. I was sleepwalking. I have a damn right to be able to sleepwalk when I won't. Okay, but you're going to walk off the cliff. Don't tell me what to do. Woke pc Yeah. Okay. Well, it is Monday. Shall we uh, move it along? We're kind of rambling. Like we always do. I guess I apologize. I guess. Anyway, what do we have in store for you here in the Bistro Cafe as we begin this uh, River City Hash Mondays at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? And yes, the Weaponization Committee wants to be Benghazi 2.0. They do. On the rest of the menu, Silicon Valley Bank CEO Greg Becker should return the $3.6 million in company stock he dumped just days before the banks collapse. Houston has joined other Democratic cities around the country fighting takeovers by Republican state legislatures. And your Girl Scout cookie delivery is crumbling under supply chain woes and a labor shortage. You see what I did there. After the break, we move to the chef's table where oil giant Saudi Aramco announced a historic $161 $161 billion profit in 2022, like it was a good thing. And Russia added the World Wildlife Fund to its register of foreign agents. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so. Across the page to the left and down just a tad near the bottom of our old page at netrootsradio.com, you will notice the uh, link to our Patreon page. And, of course, uh, that is where you can help us pay our bills. And if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink and send those funds to us once a month, that really does help us pay our bills. So thanks for relieving in progressive talk for the rest of us. Thank you for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable at Justice Putnam. I incidentally post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime and get that linked up on those social media platforms. I really do. I try. But regardless, you can get the actual articles that we are drawing from by accessing that uh, show notes and links diary over there at Daily Coast. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. Alrighty, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays is by Pranshu Verma and Tony Rome from the Washington Post. The list of companies and banks potentially affected by Friday's collapse of Silicon Valley Bank is growing, but at least one person seems to have cashed in recently. Chief Executive Greg Becker, whose trust sold $3.6 million worth of shares on February 27th, according to SEC filings. Becker is now under scrutiny, including from a personal acquaintance, Democratic California Rep. Ro Khanna, who said yesterday, Sunday, that Becker should give that money back. There should be a clawback. Of any of that money, Kana said in an interview with the Post, it should be going to the depositors. The sharp comments from Kana, who represents the district where Silicon Valley Bank was headquartered, comes amid a furor in Washington over what the government's role should be in bailing out the bank and making its customers whole. Representatives of Silicon Valley Bank did not immediately return a request for comment. Kana offered a note of caution and said the sale may not indicate wrongdoing. It's important to understand before casting aspersions on someone's motive, whether it's a scheduled sale, which are done many months before, he said. We do need all the facts to come out before jumping to conclusions. If there is evidence of bad behavior, the government could sue, he said. Shortly after Silicon Valley Bank disclosed a $1.8 billion, with a B, loss to shareholders that sparked a run, the FDIC shut it down on Friday and, could, and took control of its deposits. The U.S. government on Sunday night said that all depositors at the collapsed Silicon Valley Bank would have access to their money on Monday morning. The announcement appeared to cover deposits worth more than 250 grand. That's the federally insured limit. More than 90% of the bank's customers, which includes titans of the technology industry, have account balances above this. Earlier Sunday, federal authorities were strongly considering safeguarding all uninsured deposits at Silicon Valley Bank if regulators do not find a buyer for the bank, an extraordinary intervention likely aimed at preventing potential panic in the U.S. financial system. Treasury Secretary Janet L. Yellen said yesterday Sunday that the U.S. government has been working with regulators to devise a plan to help affected customers. Critics have warned that any support from the government could set, set a troubling precedent. Wait a second. <laughs> that's already been set, but that's another that's another argument. Uh, 
And this troubling president currently uh, leading other banks to expect federal authorities to intervene if they went under. It could also spark a populist backlash over the appearance of U.S. taxpayer money going to save some of the country's richest residents. Oh, really? You're a little late on that one. U.S. government officials on Sunday night said no losses associated with their plan to support Silicon Valley Bank will be borne by the taxpayer. For his part, Kana said the federal government should make Silicon Valley Bank customers whole. Many of its customers, which range from companies that provide payroll to vineyards to climate startups, have not done anything wrong, he said. They didn't take risks. They just had their money in a bank. And we're saying those need to be guaranteed. Zano and Paul J. Weber of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. In four years of Houston schools being under threat of one of the biggest state takeovers ever in the U.S., teacher Arnetta Murray says the district has come a long way. As Houston braces for a decision from the state on whether it will seize control of public schools in Texas's largest city, Murray thinks the fight isn't just about failing grades. I think that we focus on changing the narrative and doing different and sharing that. Hey, why is Governor Abbott attacking Houston, said Murray, a 57, who teaches special education at a middle school where most students are classified as economically disadvantaged. Why is it? Is it money? Is it politics? She asked. Classrooms are not the only place where Houston officials and residents are scrambling to hold the line against potential takeovers that the city's Democratic leaders see as driven by politics in a state where Republicans control the state house and the governor's office. Election fumbles and accusations that local leaders unlawfully reduce spending on law enforcement are also igniting potential interventions from Republicans who have been losing ground around Houston over the last decade. Intertwined in this are issues of race, as Houston has a large black and Hispanic population. Houston is the largest city in the U.S. where potential takeovers of local institutions are roiling heavily minority communities, including St. Louis and Washington, D.C. It's also an extension of a broader fight in the U.S., of state houses flexing control over municipalities. What's different in Houston, local leaders say, is the range of efforts aimed at controlling how America's fourth largest city, home to over two million people, runs classrooms, elections, and budgets. Republicans reject accusations of politics, saying they have a duty to act. Yeah, that's it. What you're seeing is just Specific spites about, quite frankly, what is best, public policy, said Republican State Senator Paul Bettencourt of Houston, who is carrying a bill that would allow the state to take over a lo local elections office for cause. Do you want to have defunded police or not? Do you want to have competent elections administrations or not? Do you want to have an uncorrupt school board of your largest district or not? That's really what these fights are about. He said, not in that accent, but you get what I mean. Renee Cross, the senior executive director of the Hobby School of Public Affairs at the University of Houston, said it could be 10 to 20 years before the tension eases up between the GOP run state government and Texas's democratically run large metropolitan areas, including Houston, until the legislature is a little more diverse in terms of partisanship. I think we're going to continue to see these efforts, Cross said. It is unclear when the state will make a decision about the Houston Independent School District with nearly 
200,000 students is the eighth largest in the U.S. Teachers and administrators have been on edge since Mayor Sylvester Turner said at a city council meeting this month that a takeover could be imminent, citing conversations with Houston legislators. The decision is up to the Texas administration. Or education agency, which said in a statement that it was still determining next steps that, quote, best support the students, teachers, parents, and school community, end quote, which means they're trying to figure it out and they're going to do it. A spokesperson for Abbott who appoints the state's education commissioner did not return a message seeking comment. Why would they? Because, you know, I mean, the press is woke, right? The state began considering the move in 2019 following allegations of misconduct by school trustees, including inappropriate influencing of vendor contracts and years of chronically low academic scores at one of its roughly 50 high schools. Since 2016, the district has had three superintendents. Now, let's be clear. These decade-long efforts to star public education of needed funds. (laughs) And now (laughs) they always do this. Okay. All right. The district sued to block intervention, but changes in state law in response to the lawsuit and a ruling by the Texas Supreme Court in January cleared a path for the takeover. us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. For some Girl Scouts and their bake sale fans, it's shaping up to be another tough cookie season. Blame the coronavirus pandemic for the wildly facilitating or vacillating supply and demand over the past two years. A surplus of unsold cookies in 2021 and supply chain issues in 2022. This year is seeing similar problems. Last month, the Girl Scouts' hotly anticipated new cookie sold out faster than Beyonce tickets and wound up on eBay for four times the price. Louisville-based Little Brownie Bakers this week blamed the familiar forces of supply chain and labor shortages with extreme weather thrown into the mix for those production delays that have disrupted this season's cookie fulfillment efforts. I want my Girl Scout cookies. Where are they? Little Brownie Bakers is one of only two companies licensed to make the cookies and it bakes for the vast majority of Girl Scout needs. We share the frustration that some Girl Scout troops feel this cookie season, Little Brownie Baker said in a statement, assuring Girl Scouts and their customers that the teams in our bakery have been working over time to make sure troops get their initial orders. In an email to the Washington Post on Saturday, a spokesperson for Little Brownie Baker said that while a host of issues have affected the selling season, the bakery is on track to fulfill initial orders. Still, Little Brownie Bakers has produced more Girl Scout cookies at this time than last year, and our teams at the bakery are working hard to ensure Initial orders are filled, the spokesperson said. Leadership for Teamsters Local 783, which represents an array of jobs at the facility, including bakers, mixers, forklift drivers, caramel mixers, and mechanics, 
did not respond to requests for comment. Across the United States, Girl Scout Councils, the broader geographic body that consists of local troops, contract with Little Brownie Bakers or ABC Bakers, the only two facilities licensed to make the cookies. According to CNBC, Little Brownie Bakers supplies 75% of all local troops which have struggled this season to meet sales goals amid the delays. Like I said, I want my Girl Scout cookies. But it brings us to our break, and we better get on to our break. And when we get back from said break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Tech Bro. Guy Ritchie's latest action comedy, Operation Fortune, Ruse de Guerre, doesn't waste any time getting the action going. Beginning and ending with a bang, the movie relies on Ritchie's tried and true formula of star ensemble, fast-paced action, and smart, twisty plot. Jason Stratham stars as Orson Fortune, an agent contracted by the British government to track down and retrieve a stolen package known only as The Handle. Along with a team composed of a computer hacker named Sarah, played by a scene-stealing Aubrey Plaza and an every man named JJ, Fortune quickly realizes that this job isn't going to be as simple as he was thinking. In order to complete the mission, the team discovers that they will need the assistance of Danny, a slightly past his prime action star who reluctantly agrees to help only after being threatened with blackmail. As it turns out, the team needs Danny so they can get in physical contact with the mysterious tech entrepreneur turned philanthropist Greg, who apparently understands the handle's significance. Greg, who's played by none other than Hugh Grant, looking like a cross between Bill Gates and the late Uber producer Robert Evans, quickly becomes the most memorable character in the film. Grant appears to be having a whale of a time bringing off this role and manages to make Greg more than a caricature. Each of his appearances are a treat. Add to this a tight script, on-point editing and cinematography that takes full advantage of its multiple exotic locations, and Operation Fortune makes for an entertaining romp. It's arguably Richie's funniest movie in years and may be a good post-Oscars antidote for anyone looking for a fun, sunny movie to counter winter chill and heavy cinema. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. you love them enough to turn off your music and pretend like their music is your music. Ah, oh, this is mommy's jam. Then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're in the right car seat. Let's play it again. Check today at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Act Council. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. Who, me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council.
Hey, Dad, your prescription will be ready in just a minute. Hey, Dad, your laundry will be ready in just a minute. Dad, your lunch will be ready in just a minute. Hey, honey, why don't you take a minute? When you help care for a loved one, you give them as much time as you can, making sure they're safe and comfortable. But it's just as important that you take some time for yourself. At AARP, we can help with information and useful tips on how you can maintain a healthy life balance, care for your own physical and mental well-being, and manage the challenges of caring for a loved one. Because the better care you take of yourself, the better care you can provide for your loved one. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. You're there for them. We're here for you. Find free care guides to support you and your loved one at aarp.org slash caregiving. That's aarp.org slash caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Arthritis is common among veterans. Traumatic and overuse injuries during active duty are risk factors for developing arthritis. Fortunately, there are low-cost or no-cost strategies that can help veterans manage arthritis. Physical activity can reduce pain and improve function. It can also help improve mood and play a role in managing other chronic conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. You can do low-impact activities, such as walking, biking, swimming, and water aerobics, all good forms of exercise. Arthritis-specific classes can help you get started. Information on classes, exercise programs, and tools are available at cdc.gov arthritis. These resources can help reduce pain and improve function. Learning self-management techniques can help all veterans become more active, improve their overall quality of life, and thrive. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Could much of the First Amendment soon be repealed? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. A 1964 Supreme Court case, New York Times v. Sullivan, allows you and the media to report on or criticize public figures without undue fear that you'll get sued for defamation. Sullivan holds that under the First Amendment, if you or a media outlet says something untrue about a public figure intentionally or with reckless disregard for whether it's true or not, the public figure can sue you. Fair enough. But otherwise, the speech is constitutionally protected. Good. Sullivan allows investigative reporters to investigate and voters to criticize elected officials. Without Sullivan, important speech will be chilled, which could happen. A proposed law in Florida is designed to reverse Sullivan. The proposal says, for example, that anonymous sources such as Watergate are presumptively false and that a political person's private or business life is not part of their public person. The law is intended to shut down speech and reporting. It is also designed to go to the Supreme Court so that, proponents hope, Sullivan will be overruled. Keep careful watch on Florida. There's a legislative knife there pointed at a vital artery of the First Amendment. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1946. That was the day that United Auto Worker members won an 18.5 cent hourly raise after a four-month strike against General Motors. After World War II, workers grew increasingly frustrated. The war years were a time of labor peace, as most unions agreed not to go out on strike in order to support the war production efforts. But during the war, as companies raked in profits, many workers felt that they were not receiving a fair share. 
Worse, wartime shortages saw the price of consumer goods skyrocket. A dollar simply could not stretch as far as it once had. After the war ended, the workers wanted to make up for the ground they felt they had lost during the conflict. A wave of strikes washed over the United States. Walter Ruther led the auto workers out on strike on November 21, 1945. Their demand was a 30% raise. Ruther publicly argued that General Motors could afford to pay the raise without raising the price of their cars. He urged the company to open its books so the public could see their finances. The UAW laid out its reasoning in a report entitled Purchasing Power for Prosperity. The strike wore on for more than 100 days, but the union had done a good job making its case to the public. Finally, General Motors agreed to a raise, as well as improved benefits such as a better recognition of seniority and promotions and protections for the union members. The contract was seen as a huge step forward for organized labor to take a seat at the table with capital. The strike and its settlement solidified Ruther as the leader of the UAW and a powerful voice for workers. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America where it is currently 44 degrees Fahrenheit expecting a high in the upper 40s. Looks like we have, uh, well, we have rain, and we'll have rain throughout the day. Winds will be out of the west-southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Expecting about an inch of rain today, and then a steady rain this evening. Showers continuing overnight, lows in the mid-30s. And it looks like it is going to bring with it a quarter inch of rain, and then three quarters of an inch of rain tomorrow with highs around 44. Winds light and variable. And a chance of rain tomorrow at 100%. Like I said, bringing with it looks like uh, three quarters of an inch or more. Pollen is still rated as none here in the town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is good at 23 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is moderate at level four. It's gone up a tad. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 29.83 inches. Visibility is at 6 miles. And relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 56 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 58 and cloudy. Rome is 68 and sunny. Kiev is 45 degrees and cloudy. Kabul is 53 and clear. Hong Kong is 66 and fair. Tokyo is 50 degrees and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 71 degrees and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 56 and cloudy. And New York, New York is 43 degrees Fahrenheit with showers in the vicinity. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. A 
of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. Oil giant Saudi Aramco reported yesterday Sunday earning $161 billion last year, claiming the highest ever recorded annual profit by a publicly listed company and drawing immediate criticism from activists. The monster profit by, uh, by the firm, known formerly as the Saudi Arabian Oil Company, came off the back of energy prices rising after Russia launched its war in Ukraine in February of 2022, with sanctions limiting the sale of Moscow's oil and natural gas in Western markets. Aramco also hopes to increase its production to take advantage of market demand as China re-enters the global market after lifting its coronavirus restrictions. That could raise the billions needed to pay for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's plan to develop futuristic cityscapes to pivot Saudi Arabia away from oil. However, those plans come despite growing international concerns over the burning of fossil fuels accelerating climate change. Meanwhile, higher energy prices already have strained relationships between Riyadh and Washington, as well as driven up inflation worldwide. Given that we anticipate oil and gas will remain essential for the foreseeable future, the risks of underinvestment in our industry are real, including contributing to higher energy prices. Saudi Aramco CEO and President Amin H. Nasser said in a statement. I'm sure he was winking when he said it, too. Profits rose 46.5% when compared to the company's 2021 results of $110 billion. It earned $49 billion in 2020 when the world faced the worst of the coronavirus pandemic lockdown. Travel disruptions and oil prices were briefly going negative. Aramco put its crude production at around 11.5 million barrels a day in 2022 and said it hoped to reach 13 million barrels a day by 2027. To boost that production, it plans to spend as much as $55 billion this year on capital projects. Aramco also declared a dividend of $19.5 billion for the fourth quarter of 2022, to be paid in the first quarter of this year. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Staff and the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Russia added the World Wildlife Fund to its Register of Foreign Agents, along with a prominent Kremlin critic, a renowned economist, and a few others. Russian law requires individuals and organizations that are determined to have received foreign funding and to have engaged in loosely defined political activity to identify themselves as foreign agents. The label brings additional government scrutiny and also carries a strong pejorative connotation in Russia. Authorities have used the law to discredit those listed and to stifle dissent. The World Wildlife Fund, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C., is a conservation group with projects throughout the world, including in Russia. 
Excluding, explaining the decision in Moscow, the Russian Justice Ministry said the organization, under the guise of protecting nature and the environment, tried to influence the decisions of the executive and legislative authorities and hindered the implementation of industrial and infrastructure projects. So is that what they call it? WWF representatives told Russian news site Medusa that the decision to designate the organization as a foreign agent was unfounded. They promised to contest in court and stressed the group would continue to protect rare animal species and preserve Russia's nature. The ministry also added Russian economist Sergei Guriev, a professor at Sciences Po, a French university also known as the Paris Institute of Political Studies, to the list. It accused Guriev, a vocal critic of the Kremlin, of speaking negatively about the servicemen of the Russian armed forces and spreading through foreign media false information about decisions Russia's state bodies make and policies they implement. Other individuals added to the register included Gennady Gudov, or Gudkov, a former lawmaker turned opposition figure who has publicly opposed what the Kremlin calls a specialist military operation in Ukraine, and feminist blogger Nika Vodvud. Vodvud, the ministry said, openly spoke out in support of Ukraine, discredited the notion of serving one's fatherland and formed negative attitudes towards military service. Well, good for her. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Shouter Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow. Right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert dans tel et des des photos de bord de mer de manche à d'un hiver je voudrais de la lumière comme en nouvelle Angleterre je veux changer d'atmosphère de manche à d'un hiver ma robe à fleurs la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Les années passent Qu'il est loin, là je tombe Nul ne peut nous entendre Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ba-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 